Welcome to my 300 pound DIY heat pump project. So I wanted to do an update tour of my heat pump because a lot's changed since the last tour and I wanted to share all the experience and things that I've learnt. So this is my heat pump, it's the Airflex 15. Uh, it's got a coefficient of performance of 2.3 out of the box. Now I think with all my enhancements and hacks and things that I've done to it, I think because I'm running it like a mini split system, I think I'm getting a coefficient of performance of something similar to what a mini split system would have, which is around three, maybe a bit more. Uh, so it's hard to measure though. So we'll see. Um, I've put it in my garage and I'm ducting the heat around my house using flexible ducting. It's easy to do. I've I've just used six inch flexible ducting with you know duct tape to stick it together, and I've drilled six inch holes into adjacent rooms around, adjacent to the garage, and and ducted it through there. And then the the heat returns to the heat pump through the internal doors. It's just got gaps in the doors, so the uh, the ducts come into the adjacent rooms into cupboards. And then in the cupboards, you've got grills on the cupboards. And so the heat comes in, the hot air comes through those grills. And you, so you can't see the ducting in other rooms. The only ducting you can see is in the garage and that hides it all. It also having it in the garage makes it quiet because you can't hear it in the rest of the house. And uh, it's also, as it turns out, it's crucial for the low temperature operation to have that duct to another room. That is a crucial thing and I didn't realize that, uh, but I've, I have learned that now. So I thought I'd just run through all the different enhancements and mods that I've done to the ducting and, and various systems around the heat pump. Um, so the, the first one I've, I've already mentioned, which is the, the duct to another room. And, and it's important that that duct splits immediately after the hot air art comes out of the heat pump, the duct has to split into two ducts because you can't just have one long duct coming off the heat pump because that restricts the flow of, of air too much and, and negatively impacts the efficiency. So you, you've got to have two ducts coming out. I've learned that uh, through my experiments as well. Um, so that's number one. The next is I've blocked the, the impeller. Now these things have a a condensate impeller to re-evaporate the uh, condensate and that's great for air conditioning but I've blocked it because you don't want to be evaporating water all the time it's not good for the efficiency of the thing um, so that's number two and as a result of that the condensate builds up in the bottom of it and what I've had to do uh, I've had to add a condensate pump to drain out all this condensate and that's mod number three. So here's my condensate pump. It's running right now. And you can just about see the, the bubbles. Uh, now the condensate pump has to be controlled because otherwise it runs dry. So mod number four is adding a timer circuit to run the pump. This is my timing circuit it's a bit rough it's been for a few different modifications but it works so if it ain't broke don't fix it and it runs every 10 minutes it runs for 30 35 seconds and that's just to stop the pump from running dry and breaking mod number five is i've added a second duct to split the cold and hot sides of the heat pump and that way it acts like a mini split heat pump and that enhances its efficiency. So here is my second duct and this pulls cold air into my heat pump, into the cold side of my heat pump and then it gets blown out the door again. So there's a, that's the cold circuit and it's a mini split because that cold side is split from a hot side which is here and the hot air input down down there on the other side it also enhances its cold weather performance so one problem with this mod uh, is that it can't defrost on running on outside air because the outside air is often too cold so 
as a result of that mod, I've had to do another mod, which is to add a three-way duct to allow it to use inside air to defrost. Uh, so that's mod number six. So here is my three-way control valve. Let me show you it in action. There you go. There's the solenoid kicking in. There you go. And I was manually operating that to begin with, but mod number seven is that I've added a solenoid valve, a control, a temperature controller with a solenoid valve to automate that that valve. And I've uh, the way I've configured it is it has a temperature sensor in the output duct, at the hot air output. And it measures if that that hot air output if that drops in temperature that basically means it's all blocked up with ice all the cold zone is blocked with ice and it's not heat pumping anymore so what happens then is it shunts the solenoid out over and starts using inside air to defrost it and that works really well uh, it's um you can just leave it running now and you'll never walk back to it and find it's all blocked with ice. Uh, so yeah, I'm pleased with that. So mod, mod number eight is I've used a plug timer to make sure it uses the cheap rate electricity. Now I'm on Cozy Octopus, which is a heat pump tariff. Uh, it's an experimental tariff and it gives me a cheap, it gives me two cheap rates um, of 20p a kilowatt hour. And then most of the rest of the time, it's 33p a kilowatt hour. But then for a three hour window, when during the peak rate, it goes up to like 50p a kilowatt hour. So I've made sure my heat pump switches off during this period with my plug timer. And uh, yeah, you just it just switches off between four and seven. That's all it does. Now have a look in uh, the description if you want a link to Octopus Energy, you can still transfer to this tariff. You need to phone them up though. And if you use my link, then you'll save yourself 50 pounds and I'll save 50 pounds as well. Number nine, I've added a ratchet strap around it and this reduces the panel noise. There's my ratchet strap, makes it quiet. For some reason, if you push in there, it makes it quiet. So I put a, a thingy there and a ratchet strap that pushes it in and it makes it quiet. I don't know why that is, but that's the way it is. It might be because it, when I bought it, it was slightly damaged. It was like a factory second or something or return. And it had a bit of damage to one of the panels. And mod number 10 was I've, what I've done is I've, because some of the rooms, the bedrooms, they've got three bedrooms in this house that aren't on the main route for the heat pump hot air. So what I've done uh, is I've relocated the boiler thermostat. I've changed it to a wireless model and I've moved this wireless thermostat into the, uh, the, the bedrooms that get cooler. And so I've basically got two zones in the house now. So I've got the heat pump zone, which is like 67% of the house is the heat pump. And then those three bedrooms and the boiler uh, looks after those three bedrooms and the heat pump looks after the rest of the house. Um, and that works pretty well. Now, what I've not done is I've not modified the heat pump at all. I've not opened it up. I've not had a look inside. It's all completely factory standard. So the benefit of this is if it was ever to break, I could just buy a new one and swap it within like five minutes. I could just ducked it back up and it'd be it, that done. So that's good. So with all these enhancements, it's uh, basically fully automated. And yeah, it's really good. I can I can just leave it alone and it just works. It's just really, it's really reliable now. But there are a few things I do have to worry about, uh, do, you know, to pay attention to. And uh, I thought I'd share them with you as well. Uh, so the first one is 
I have to maintain the garage temperature. Um, so when it gets really cold outside uh, and, and the heat pump starts using more and more inside air, what that does is it sucks in cold air from outside into the garage a little bit and the garage temperature can drop a little bit and, and you can end up with a frozen heat pump still. So what I, all I need to do when it gets, I pay attention to the outside temperature and when it gets below freezing, I just crack the, the hot air duct a little bit. And I just crack that duct a little bit. And you get a bit of heat leaking out around the sides and that's enough to keep the, the garage warm. That keeps the garage temperature above like 12 degrees and then that's enough to defrost for the heat pump to defrost and it's all right um, the other thing is a problem common to boilers as well it's a frozen condensate pipe so i have had one frozen condensate pipe and i came home to like a puddle of water underneath my heat pump because it couldn't go to the drain um, and all i did to fix that was i just diverted it into a bucket for a, for a few days and, um, and that, that worked very nicely. Uh, and another problem is I do get like a random puddle of condensate underneath it every now and then. I'm not sure why this is. I, I think it might be to do with it being like when it's really humid and I'm drying laundry inside as well. So you've got humid air outside and inside. It might be just overwhelming the heat pump, um, you know, the condensate pump but it's, it's fine, it's such a small amount of water that you can just set the laundry fan on it and it evaporates, so it's not a problem. Results, so here is a gas bill uh, for summer and this helps us see how much gas is used for hot water and cooking. Uh, and that turns out to be about 10 kilowatt hours a day. Now, here are two gas bills for winter and these were from November to February. And this was before the heat pump uh, to see how much space heating our house needs. And I looked up the average temperature for these months on the Met Office website to help compare. Uh, and the monthly temperature was six to seven degrees. And we used about 38 kilowatt hours a day for that, for that heat demand. So here is my first gas bill for last winter when the heat pump was installed and the temperatures were comparable to the before heat pump bill. And it, so it looks like we used about 75% heat pump and a new quarter gas bill. Um, and we weren't using gas for hot water during this period, we we're using electric. Uh, so yeah, it looks like about 75% heat pump power. And this is my first gas bill this year with the heat pump. And it was unusually warm during the first part of this year. And we used 100% heat pump, we didn't use any gas for heating, um, except for hot water, because we changed tariffs on the, on the gas and electric. It became cheaper to use gas for hot water instead of electric. So I switched over halfway through this bill and also for cooking as well. So this is all for gas usage for cooking and hot water. And then in, in my next bill, this was during a freezing cold snap and we had snow and you know negative temperatures. And, but the average temperature from the Met Office was 4.1 degrees. Now, I think the heat pump was about um, two thirds, it was two thirds heat pump and one third gas. Uh, looking at my, my graph and how much gas, I think the house needed about 60 kilowatt hours a day during this period, judging by the graph, but it's hard to say. So this is the latest gas bill for January and the temperatures look comparable to the before heat pump, the, the gas bill. And so th this one looks like about 10 kilowatt hours a day for, uh, for gas for heating. So that's probably about 75% heat pump. So if you take all these bills together, it looks like uh, the heat pump's doing sort of 80 to 90% of the, 
of the heat demand for the house, which is pretty good. I've, I've given up on completely running the house on the heat pump. That was my original aim, was to you know get rid of all gas consumption in the house. Um, but I've, I've given up on that because, uh, well, for a, and I've settled on a hybrid heat pump system using the hybrid, using the gas boiler and the heat pump. So first of all, the ducts don't reach all the rooms. So there's that three bedrooms I talked about that do need radiators to, to maintain temperature. So there's a sort of diminishing return where if I wanted to get rid of the last remaining 15% of gas that I use, then I'd have to buy two heat pumps. And that's a lot of fuss for very little gain. So I don't want to do that. And uh, yeah, I'd need twice the amount of ducts. So I'd like to have to drill twice the amount of holes and have it just look ugly. And I, I don't really want it, don't need to do that. And yeah, I've still got, so there's that three hour peak where I, where the heat pump switches off. So sometimes the, the gas boiler switches on at that point. And also now that all the electric and gas has gone up because of the war in Ukraine and stuff, it's uh, I'm paying more attention to energy saving rather than becoming carbon neutral. So I'd rather make it cheaper for me. So that's that's changed my priorities a little bit. So my cozy octopus tariff uh, averages out to be around 29p a kilowatt hour. And my gas is 10.3p a kilowatt hour. Uh, and if we assume my gas boiler is 85% efficient, then the heat pump would need to be a coefficient of performance of 2.4 or greater for it to be cheaper than the gas boiler. And if we look at this graph of coefficient of performance versus temperature, we can see basically it is always better than 2.4 coefficient of performance until it gets down to really cold temperatures where it's below freezing. And at that point, the gas boiler takes over anyway. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a really good system. So on average, it looks like this is saving about four pence a kilowatt hour, which averaged out over a year would save about 200 pounds a year. And uh, yeah, it's really good. It's, it's been operating flawlessly and reliably. And um, I've put about three megawatt hours through it now. Um, a bit more than just over three megawatt hours of Alecky, and that has made about 10 megawatt hours of, of heat, and that's served me through the winter, a couple of winters now. Goodbye.